At the heart of Jesus' work is the achievement of breaking down barriers. Barriers between formerly divided people. But more significant even than that, breaking down the barrier between sinful humanity and a holy God. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you've joined us today as we continue a series from the book of Ephesians. It's called The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. And Jonathan, as you've pointed out, God broke down barriers. Jesus, you know, God incarnate, broke down this barrier between God the Father and sinful man. How did he do that? Well, the great barrier between humanity, a sinful humanity, and a holy God is is the barrier of our wrongdoing, our rebellion, uh, what the Bible calls our sin. And a, a holy God who has perfect standards, he can't tolerate wrongdoing. Uh, he can't tolerate the defilement of sin. And so if we're going to have a restored relationship with God, that barrier of sin needs to be removed. And that that's what was taking place at the cross of Christ. Do you find culture, though, not necessarily recognizing that we have this barrier between us and God? It seems like there are a lot of people who think there's no real barrier between me and God. I, I can come to him whenever I want, however I want, through any way I want. Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think there is a, a popular narrative, which is very much along the lines of what you just described, Steve. I think, though, there is also people's own personal experience and their sense of distance from God. <laughs> and I think a lot of people recognize in their heart of hearts that things aren't right between them and their maker. They recognize that their wrongdoing sets them at odds with the God who is both creator and judge. And I think a lot of people... Probably many listening today would be my guess, have this sense of distance from God and wonder how how can this be overcome? What can be done about it? We're going to look at that today. So stay with us. And if you can, grab a Bible and open it to the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter two as we begin a message called One in Christ. Here is Jonathan. Well, it is a terrible thing to be an outsider to be excluded from a community, to find yourself on the wrong side of a wall. Humanitarian crises often highlight the agony of this particular dynamic. I was struck recently to see images of great crowds of people thronging the Simon Bolivar International Bridge spanning the border between Colombia and Venezuela in the eastern Andes. As the economic crisis in Venezuela has increasingly become a humanitarian crisis, very large crowds have been gathering daily on that bridge, building overnight until the bridge opens in the morning, with desperate people seeking access to Colombia to get food and medicines that are no longer available at home. It's a tragically familiar scene. It's been repeated in recent days on the Guatemala-Mexico border. Some of you have seen that on the international bridge there. And it's paralleled again and again and again in areas of crisis and difficulty around the world, whether it be the borders of Syria or the ports of Europe. It's a desperate thing to be excluded. It's a painful thing to be in a hopeless place, to long for access to a place where there is life and there is a future. As Paul addresses the church at Ephesus here in chapter 2 of Ephesians, in the second half of the chapter, he wants to remind the Gentile readers, and he wants to remind us as well, of the experience of being outsiders. Outsiders to the land of promise and to the covenant of salvation. He wants to remind us of how it was so that we might rejoice afresh and rejoice more deeply together in our miraculous inclusion in Christ. The instruction of verse 11 is the only instruction of the passage. It's the main thing we're meant to be doing as we reflect together on these truths. Therefore, remember, says Paul. Remember, it is perhaps the only occasion in the New Testament where we are directly and explicitly told to look back on and contemplate our former life apart from Christ before we came to Christ. But Paul wants us to be sure that we take a few moments together to do that very thing. 
In former days, the uncircumcised Gentiles, verse 11, had no access to the nation of promise. They had no hope in Christ, the Messiah, the coming King of Israel, verse 12. They weren't allowed citizenship in God's nation. They had no part in His covenants of promise. They were, end of the verse, without hope and without God in the world. From our vantage point in history today, it's difficult to think back to a time, to imagine a time when the main dividing barrier in the world, the biggest dividing line in the world, was the dividing line between Jew and Gentile. But before the coming of Christ, as far as the nation of Israel was concerned, before the scriptures of Israel were concerned, that was the main division. If you belonged to Israel, you had access to God through His covenant, to the one and only living God. You could approach Him at His temple through the priests and through the sacrificial system. If you belonged to His covenant people, well, you had hope of salvation at the final day. But if you were a Gentile, well, you you were excluded, excluded from God, excluded from His temple, excluded from His salvation. Now, at this point, as we consider these truths, we need to remember that God's salvation purposes were actually focused on the nation of Israel to begin with. That was his plan. That was his intention. He called Abram, you'll remember in Genesis 12, the father of the nation. He called him to himself, and he promised Abram, then Abraham, that he and his offspring would enjoy great blessings and great favor. God's plan, right from the start, right from Genesis 12, was that Israel would become and would be his means of bringing salvation to the world. They're the starting point. They're the foundation. In Genesis 12, God told Abram that he would bless him, he would bless his family, and he would bless the world through him. Now, that day of wider blessing, it would come. In fact, it did come with the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah. But before the coming of Christ, before that great day, if you didn't belong to Israel, you were beyond the reach of the salvation plans and purposes of God. You were a true outsider. You were on the wrong side of the fence. You were on the far side of the bridge. And Paul wants these Gentiles to remember, as he writes, he wants them to feel again something of the force of that experience. And he wants us here today to remember it too. He wants us to remember it because the reality of having been an outsider to the purposes and plans and salvation of God, that was actually our reality, and that was our experience. That's the spiritual story. That's the spiritual biography of each one of us here, and Paul, he doesn't want us to forget it. Ultimately, of course, he wants to remind us that Jesus has intervened gloriously through the gospel, and he's changed everything for us. For a people who were once excluded, once outcasts, once without hope, he's, he's brought us near. He's taken us in, near to God and near to one another as well. Those two things go together. In a sense, verse 13 of our passage gives us a summary of Paul's key emphasis and the main thing he wants to get across. He writes this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. That's the basic truth that Paul wants to drive home for us today and the thing that he wants to impress upon our hearts. And so in the rest of the passage, over the next two paragraphs there, he unwraps this reality for us, and he tells us just what Jesus has done to bring us near. He tells us just what Jesus has done in making outsiders insiders within his family and within his kingdom. He wants us to see that this great miracle, and it is a miracle, has involved a process both of breaking down and of building up. We start with the destructive side to bring us near, to transform us from outsiders to insiders. Jesus has broken down barriers. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. One of the greatest tragedies of sin is the division that it brings and that it increases. We, we see it right back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve rebel against God. Their openness and their unity with one another was destroyed in an instant. It happened right away. And their fellowship with God was shattered at the very same time. As soon as sin enters the world, the very first thing that Adam and Eve do is to hide themselves from one another and to hide themselves from God as well. 
And of course, that situation has only grown and multiplied since the garden. We're divided by all kinds of things in our world, and we're good at coming up with extra divisions. We're divided by race and by culture and class and education and many other things besides. Our world is a world of barriers and walls and fences and militarized zones. One of the very special things about our situation in Canada is the nature of the border that we've enjoyed with the United States just a few kilometers down the road. It's been, for many years, the longest undefended, non-militarized border in the entire world. It's a very special thing. It's felt special because it's so unusual in a world of hostility. If we roll back the clock to Old Testament times, one of the most prominent and most famous barriers in the world was the barrier that separated Jew from Gentile in the temple courts in Jerusalem. The wall that ensured that Gentiles could not come into the inner Israelite-only sections of the temple. This barrier, this wall, marked the court of the Gentiles off from the Israelite-only areas. It bore an inscription at various points in Latin and in Greek, warning the Gentiles that if they ventured beyond Beyond this point, beyond this barrier, they would have only themselves to blame for their inevitable death. It seems pretty clear that Paul has this wall in his mind's eye as he writes verse 14. And the wall itself, it is a pretty powerful picture and symbol of the wider reality of the division between Jew and Gentile. Paul calls it a dividing wall of hostility. You'll notice that there in the text, a wall of hostility. It's a strong statement. And he does so for a good reason. There was plenty of hostility between Jew and Gentile in this time. The privileges of belonging to Israel had sometimes turned to pride and even scorn for those outside. And the surrounding nations, while they had been guilty on plenty of occasions, they had a terrible track record of mistreating and abusing the people of Israel. There was real hostility, make no mistake. Beyond the physical wall of division, there was an immense, a high and thick social and relational wall. And so with that in mind, the achievement of verse 14 is monumental. Jesus brings peace between these two groups, and he's destroyed the wall. He's broken it down. But how has he done it? How has the Lord Jesus achieved that with a wall so high and the divisions so entrenched? Well, he's done it, says Paul, verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and its regulations. The law that Paul is talking about here is quite clearly the Mosaic law, the law that set out the rules and regulations governing life within the covenant community of Israel, laws and regulations surrounding the distinctive diet of the people, purity regulations, regulations for worship, regulations governing what to wear and how to run your farm, regulations that in a whole host of different ways marked off the people of Israel from the surrounding nations and it kept them distinct. The Mosaic law was an immovable feature of life within the nation of Israel. But the Lord Jesus, in his perfect life, he fulfilled all the requirements of that law, every one of them. And in his sin-bearing death, he bore the penalty for sinful humanity's failure to live up to the standards of that law. And so Paul can now say, because of Jesus' life and Jesus' death, verse 15, he has in his flesh abolished the law. And sure enough, as we read the New Testament carefully, we find that those food and those purity and ceremonial regulations are now set aside for the people of God. Christians can eat pork and shellfish and wear garments woven of two types of cloth, things not possible under the Mosaic Code. All those markers of distinction, those ceremonial and cultic markers of distinction, they're not needed anymore. Not needed because the people of God is now made up of Jews and Gentiles together. And the supreme thing that marks out this people is not conformity to a set of regulations. Oh no, it is devotion to a person. It's about belonging to Jesus Christ. Don't you just love the clarity? and the simplicity of that. It is about belonging to Jesus Christ. That's what our message today is all about. It's entitled One in Christ, and it comes from the book of Ephesians chapter 2. We'll get back to this in just a moment. I want to let you know if you ever miss a broadcast or maybe you join us late or can't stay with us through the end of the program, you can always listen online. 
just come to our website and you can listen to programs there. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. That is EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. Now, that's what Paul is getting at when he says in the middle of verse 15 that the Lord's purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. To the outside observer, it might look as though Jesus' great ambition was to create a new sect within Judaism or even a new religion altogether. But Jesus' purpose was actually far grander, far more ambitious than that. He was actually creating a new humanity in himself. He was making a people remade and refashioned through his work at the cross and by the gift of his Holy Spirit. And in forming this new humanity, he takes divided people, people torn apart, people separated by sin, and he makes us one. I hesitate to use an illustration from hockey here from the NHL, just knowing the level of emotion that this can generate when we talk about such things. But as I was thinking about this dynamic, looking at the passage, I I couldn't help but reflect on the rebirth of our beloved Ottawa Senators in the 1990s. Before the Sens were reconstituted, Ottawa was a city of Leafs and Canadians fans, a city deeply divided by those conflicting loyalties. But the creation of the new Ottawa team or the recreation of the Ottawa team meant that many who formerly were on opposite sides of the great divide were able to unite as part of something new. Now, not everyone could take that step, of course, but many did. And in the divided world of hockey, and it is a divided world, that union, it is nothing short of a miracle. It's a beautiful and a, enough on hockey. <laughs> it's a beautiful and a wonderful thing, isn't it? To see the unity of the body of Christ achieved out of such diversity and even out of former animosity. Even in this room, I guess that if we went around and found it everyone's story and background, we'd probably find 50 or 60 nationalities represented just here in this hour. And the reality is that among those national and cultural groups represented even in this room, there will be a number that were formerly divided deeply along cultural and ethnic lines. Perhaps if you've come here to Canada from another country, you'll find yourself sitting in the chair here at church next to someone whose home country is actually at war with yours, where there's a situation of conflict back home where there are deep-seated historical animosities that are very, very painful and very, very real. Perhaps you find yourself sitting next to someone even today who by virtue of history, by virtue of geography, by virtue of culture, you are meant to distrust, you are meant to dislike, you are actually meant to hate. But now in Christ, here we are all together, and it's an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing. Here we are together, not ultimately identified by our various cultural groups, but rather identified by this simple fact that we belong to Jesus Christ, that we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that we've been included in the body of Jesus, and that we have been indwelled by the Spirit of Jesus. It's a miraculous thing. It's a grace-filled thing. It's a beautiful thing. At the heart of Jesus' work is the achievement of breaking down barriers, barriers between formerly divided people. But more significant even than that, breaking down the barrier between sinful humanity and a holy God. Jesus' purpose, verse 16, was in this one body, this new humanity, to reconcile both of them, both Jew and Gentile, to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. At the cross of Calvary, Jesus pays the price of our rebellion against God himself, against God the judge. He bears our guilt and he makes us acceptable to the Father. And Jesus does that for us out of his sheer grace. So that as we stand before the cross of Christ, not one of us, none of us can claim any special or superior access to God. The cross, it it levels the playing field. It means that we all approach on level ground. And as it levels the playing field, it, it does away with our hostilities. 
when I see the weight of my own guilt that Jesus willingly bore in my place, I realize that whatever I might have against you and whatever you might have against me, well, it's quite out of place to hold on to that now if I really understand what Jesus has done. Hostility melts away. And the particular laws that separated Jew and Gentile, they're, they're set aside at the cross, as we've discussed already. And so, so now both groups, Jew and Gentile and many other groups beside, have access to God on the same basis, by the same grace, through the same sacrifice. That's why Paul can speak of Jesus being our peace and of Jesus proclaiming peace. In our world of conflict, we know that true peace is very, very elusive indeed. We think back to 1938 and British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's return from his trip to Germany, uh, where he signed a peace accord with Hitler, and he announces to Britain and to the world that he has achieved peace in our time. 1938. Now think about what happens in 1939. The greatest conflict the world has ever seen. So much optimism, but so naive. Peace in this world is often elusive. It rarely endures. But Jesus has achieved something that no politician or army could ever achieve. He came, verse 17, and preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles who had no claim on God, and peace to those who were near, to Jews who could approach God at the temple but still needed to have their sin ultimately dealt with by that perfect sacrifice. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the Spirit. It's a thrilling thing to see barriers come down. Those who remember the Berlin Wall coming down will remember the thrill and the excitement of those days, all the optimism that was wrapped up in the symbolism of it, the hope of peace, the prospect of families and friends reunited, the prospect of nations reconciled. There's been talk in recent days of the military divisions between North and South Korea being removed. Who knows if that's going to come to pass? But just imagine what it could mean after decades of hostility and mistrust. It's a thrilling idea, if only vague. But now consider the achievement of the cross. At Calvary, the great barrier between humanity and God is removed. It is broken down. It is destroyed. That barrier that had been in place ever since God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden and set the cherubim with flashing swords in the way that they might not return. As God's salvation plan took shape, the temple gave very limited opportunity for the high priest to come into the presence of God so long as he came in with the appropriate sacrifice and in the appropriate way. There was an opportunity there to come near, but it was limited, it was constrained, it was partial, and it was very definitely only for the Israelites. But now, through Jesus, because of Calvary, access is open, the great barrier removed. What a great truth. Because of Jesus, we have access to God the Father. The barrier between us and Him is abolished. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message entitled, One in Christ, part of a series, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. It comes from Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll continue this next time. Hey, if you ever miss a broadcast, I want to let you know you can always listen at our website. Just come to EncounterTheTruth.org. You know, we're able to bring you Encounter the Truth because of your generosity. We are a listener-supported ministry, and so we're able to keep this program on the station because of your financial support. But we want to say thank you for your gift by sending you Jonathan's book, Living by Faith in Turbulent Times. We're taking a look at what it looks like to navigate present crises and the aftermath that follows as followers of Jesus. And Jonathan takes us to the Bible's most famous passage on the nature of authentic faith, that's the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. We look at God's never-changing word for guidance and help today and find rich encouragement from key models of faith, men and women who walked with God and trusted His promises through fearful and challenging days. This book is not only going to strengthen followers of Jesus to walk by faith, but also introduce others to the God who can be trusted in turbulent times. We'd love to send you a copy as you send a gift to support. You can give online by coming to EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 
888-998-7884. Or again, it's 833-99-TRUTH. And one last time, our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time.